All right, how many of you want to live an original life, launch a business, and make an impact on the world? I do. And while you're at it, while you're at being a good human, uh, maybe make some money along the way. Our guest tonight is weaving those elements together in a unique and compelling way. Shivani Soroya is the founder and CEO of Tala, a mobile technology and data science company that is opening up financial access for underserved people globally. Tala's smartphone app uses alternative data to deliver instant credit and help customers build their financial identities. Tala has dispersed more than $150 million in credit throughout East Africa and the Philippines and is rapidly growing throughout Latin America and Southeast Asia. Uh, formerly known as InVenture, Tala is backed by IVP, Ribbit Capital, Lowercase Capital, Data Collective, the Collaborative Fund, and other leading venture and impact investors. In 2016, Fast Company ranked Tala as one of its top 10 companies in money, and Forbes named Tala as one of the top 50 fintech companies in the world. Additionally, Tala's work has been highlighted by Forbes, The New York Times, The Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, TED, Wired, among many, many others. Uh, Tala is headquartered in Santa Monica with additional offices in Nairobi and Manila. Shivani has a wide array, array of professional experiences in global health, microfinance, and investment banking. Prior to Tala, she worked at the United Nations Population Fund, helping to develop costing models throughout Africa and Asia. She also has experience in investment banking, both in mergers and acquisitions at HealthNet, Citigroup, and equity research at UBS. She is an Aspen Institute Finance Leader Fellow, a WEF Young Global, Senior, uh, Young Global Leader, a Senior TED Fellow, and a Shoka Fellow. She holds an MPH from Columbia and a BA from Wesleyan. I'm really excited to hear this story. Let's take a look at Tala. <laughs> Welcome back to USC. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to have you. Um, you know, whenever you do like a beautiful reel like that and the business is growing so quickly, things change. Can you give us a, a little bit of a snapshot of where Tala stands today? Um, yeah, so we, I mean, I think in the intro you mentioned 160 million or oh, I something like that. A lot, huh? Uh, well, so we've done about 900 million now. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's just terrible on my part. Sorry. No, it's, it's probably our fault. We didn't send an updated bio. Um, but the other part, I guess, is you know you see two offices. Uh, you see Nairobi. You see Manila. Um, but we're now in five different countries. So we have um, we're live now in Kenya, in Tanzania, uh, in Mexico, the Philippines, and in India. Um, and then obviously our headquarters are in Santa Monica. Excellent. We will edit that whole introduction out. No, so it's totally not fine. inaccurate. Um, so before we sort of go backwards and um, we, we sort of like to start a little bit of background and where you came from, where, um, so you're, you're in how many countries now? So we're in five countries. And like, what's the reach? Give us uh, the reach of the company in terms of number of people served if you can share like how many you know, loans. And what's the standard loan amount, typical loan amount these days? Sure, um, so we've had now about seven million people uh, around the world, across our five markets, actually download the product uh, and actually build their profiles with us. Uh, we have about two and a half million people at this point that are actually uh, borrowing from our platform. Um, and so that's been exciting. And, and a typical loan, if there are typical ones, I know they range, but what's yeah. the bread and butter loan? I would say um, it goes anywhere between you know as small as ten dollars, um, as large as about five hundred dollars. Um, it will depend on the market because um, obviously you know when we think about GDP, purchasing power, etc., Mexico is going to be very different than a Kenya or an in India, um, just looking at currency. But I would say typically about hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. And that's yeah. over a thirty-day period. So really, if we think about like adjusting for purchasing power, you can think of it as like 10 to 1. So you're really looking at, if this was in the US, this would be the equivalent of someone borrowing about, I would say about $1,500 per month. And so this is, a, the, the typical term is 30 days? Yeah, so typically it's really what we learned uh, through our user research is really that the product is kind of like liquidity. It's really solving this immediate pain point of working capital, um, but also acting almost as a kind of a point of sale or a payments product as well. Um, so what we've done is taken the experience of instant, so it's a smartphone application like any other consumer app, 
combined it with aggregating multiple different kinds of transaction methods. So a customer can pick up the cash and use the cash in multiple different ways. So they can go to a bank account, they can go to a retail chain, they can use a mobile wallet, et cetera, but it's all through our app. And then the last piece is actual liquidity, actual access to capital. And so that's why we kind of think the closest thing we have um, to what you know, we know in the US is a, is a credit card product. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a short-term bridge for whatever their capital needs are. I'm fascinated with how you looked at it. I, I wanna go and look at the problem that you look to solve. But let's start with just basics. Where did you grow up? What did your parents do? Give us a little bit about your background. Sure, um, so I'm originally from India. Um, I'm an only child, <laughs> if that helps. Um, but <laughs> I, I would say that, you know, I think the way I grew up was, again, partially in India, moved to the U.S. when I was pretty young. Um, my, I think I'm a, I'm a very kind of perfect combination of my parents, you could think of. It's because I say that because I'm an only child, but my mom worked in, um, she worked across India running medical camps. Um, she's an OBGYN by training, so that kind of international development or wanting to have a purpose was really in me from the beginning. And then the other side, my dad is uh, technology investment banking, and so math and physics. Um, and so I kind of ended up this way. Um, but I, I think I always knew from the very beginning in just the way that I was raised that the thing that I think my parents taught me and my grandparents in particular said is that everyone actually has value, right? Everyone is really on an equal playing field and it's really about the opportunities we have access to that really change our path. And so I kind of always had that in the back of my mind of looking at people as saying, I wanna help everyone. Everyone, in my opinion, is trustworthy and creditworthy. And so how can we actually put that power of control and choice and access in their hands? Um, and so that's kind of where this came from. Uh, what, what age were you when you moved to the States? 13. Okay, so you did get an experience of living in India. Where in India? Uh, so my whole family is from Rajasthan, if anyone knows that. Um, but I grew up partially in Delhi. Okay. Um, it does seem, as you describe it, you know, looking backwards and lining up the dots for a young person, your dots are already very well aligned in terms of what your parents did, where you grew up, what you're doing. Um, we're a little constrained on time, so you went undergrad to Wesleyan, um, and then you went back. What, what did you do out of uh, college, first few jobs? Uh, I did investment banking, so went right into equity research at UBS. Um, had kind of a pivotal, life-changing moment uh, where I met Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in microcredit. Um, they actually brought him into our analyst program. Um, and I laugh about that because after they did that, we were second-year analysts. And literally, I quit my job a week later because I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, but about six other people from our cohort actually ended up quitting that year. Um, I'm like, why would you bring them in? Like, you literally, you know, you show us this amazing thing of how we can actually make a difference. Um, and all of us have been working like, you know, 20 hour days behind a computer. I'm like, we're of course going to be excited. <laughs> you know, has anyone taken Jessica Jackley's class here? So Jessica also snuck into a talk by Muhammad Yunus at Stanford and quit her job the next day yeah. to, to start Kiva, which is an interesting parallel. Um, although hers was nonprofit from the beginning and yours uh, has sort of migrated to, to profit. Um, okay, so you work as a investment banker. When do you decide to go back to school and for what reason? Yeah, so I, I worked in microfinance. So I quit, went back to India, worked in microfinance. Um, actually worked at two different institutions and wanted to get the experience from the inside of really understanding, you know, like, were they making a difference? Um, and if they were, I'd like to help. But what I found was, you know, while microcredit was really helping move people from subsistence living into that kind of day-to-day -day and being able to get them to a place of, I can now start actually thinking about my business. I can start making my bills consistently. Um, what I found was really it wasn't still changing the system as a whole. Um, what it did was actually create this isolated credit system, which we know is valuable, but ultimately how do we get to a place where those same customers can walk into a bank and actually be treated the same way that we are? Um, and for me, I think that was the important point of actually once I saw that firsthand, I said what I really want to fix is the system level, the data layer or the foundation behind systems. Um, 
because I think, again, it's that perception of risk that we want to change. And unless we change it with really data, I feel like you can't really get these institutions to move. And so you got your master's in public health at Columbia, right? So I got a, I will fix that too, but okay. we got, <laughs> I did a, a master's in econometrics. Um, which is much different. And then, a, and then I did do a master's in health <laughs> economics, um, which is where the MPH comes from. And from there, I mean, did you have a plan when you, when you were an investment banker and you went back to school? Did you sort of know what was coming out the other side or not really? So tell us about your transition from getting your master's degree to the UN Population Fund. Yeah, so after, so I did, I did investment banking, then I was like, don't want to do that, went into microfinance, realized, well, I felt like there were some other things there that I didn't necessarily want to do. Then, you know, I was like, well, now what do I do? So I ended up actually saying, maybe the right thing for me to do is work at an institution with someone. Um, so I worked with this amazing woman, her name was Eva Wiseman, uh, her, um, her title was basically lead economist for West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and what she was doing was actually building costing models to understand the effect of microcredit programs, development programs, like just anything we were actually funding and trying to understand whether it was actually improving quality of life. But the goal was actually to say, if we put $90 into a program or $300 or $1,000, how do we actually know that it is actually changing or make, you know, helping people progress out of poverty? Um, and so super theoretical, but the goal was actually, can we understand that at a very micro or individual level? Um, and it, for me, felt like the right timing considering what I had just seen. And so what, tell us about the work that you did at the UN Population Fund and how it sort of sowed the seeds of, of Tala. Sure. Um, yeah, so this is, um, I'm sure I, like a bunch of people here can probably relate to this story, but you know, um, I got to our first market, which was Ghana, and uh, essentially had my little cost, you know, I had my model, I was going to put my inputs in and, and leave. Um, I went to our country office and I was like, okay, I need the list of people that you've lent to, um, and then how much you've lent, and then what they've done with the money, and then, you know, essentially what, how their life has changed, and they're like, what are you talking about? Um, and they're like, look, Shivani, you've worked in these markets, all of this money is in cash, right? So when we give someone money, the money goes out, we have no idea what they do, and then the money comes back in when they repay us. Everything else is a black hole. Um, and so they're like, well, good luck. Like, we can't help you really answer that question because we don't ask those questions and we have no way to get that data because we don't have the transaction data. Um, so I called my boss and I was like, well, I can't do the project, so I guess I'll come home. And she's like, no, you're there for four and a half more months and you have a one-way ticket. And not take, I mean, you're not coming back. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, essentially, she's like, figure it out. Um, and so I did. I mean, essentially, the reason I was joking that I'm like petite is I'm pretty like I'm non-threatening, right? I don't really look like I'm going to do anything bad. Um, so I started by actually interviewing people and I asked them if I could go to work with them. And so I would pick them up in the morning and I would go from their homes to work with them so I could understand if any money left their pockets during that time. I would then go to their place of business and I would actually see how many products they sold um, and actually with my notebook sit there and see how many products they sold, services they provided, how many customers came in. I was there at the end of the day to understand you know, how much cash did they actually have at the end of the day? So how much did they earn? I would then go to the market with them and understand how much went to food and electricity, to other bill payments, to their kids' education. Uh, <clears throat> into working capital, home improvements, anything. I would then go back home with them to understand how much went to a bank account if they did that, how much went under a, a mattress or under, you know, went into a lockbox. Um, and so, I mean, essentially like what I did was actually become really proximate to the problem. Um, and I walked in their shoes or you could say I like became kind of like a walking QuickBooks, right? Um, in, over the next three and a half years, I did this across nine different countries um, and ended up doing it with 3,500 people. Um, so it was pretty life changing. <laughs> um, but it really helped that I think what I was asking was literally just to observe. 
Um, I wasn't asking them questions. I wasn't doing anything. I was just literally trying to listen and to learn. 3,500 interviews. Yeah. So remember earlier when I talked about customer discovery? <laughs> There's no one that knows her end customer better than she does. Not anybody that invests in her company, not any consultant could tell her what the customer does on a daily basis. So that's, it's a great basis from which to start a business. But you weren't starting a business then, right? You were no, just trying to, trying to solve a problem. And, and not even, right? Not even yet. Not even, yeah, I actually, I mean, at some point in the journey of the 3,500 interviews, I realized, oh my God, there's a problem across every one of these markets. Um, I kept seeing the problem over and over and over. But to be honest with you, I think until I did that amount of it, I didn't realize how widespread, how global the problem really was and why it existed. Um, and then the other part I think was I don't think I'd have this belief in our customers the way I do, or anyone at our company does, without doing that. And so state what you learned from that, the problem that you saw, and then we'll talk about sort of how it, how it transitions into a business concept, but what was the, what was the similar concept or a similar problem you saw uh, across several countries? Um, so it was a double-sided problem in the sense that you had, on one side, incredibly credit-worthy consumers, um, whether they're running a business or just individuals, that could not access the capital they needed to either improve their lives or actually grow their businesses. The reason for that was the fact that they really had no formal data. In many cases, they had no national IDs, um, no credit history, <coughs> no credit score, um, no actual formal like earning slips, um, no transaction data, so receipts, um, any of those kinds of things did not exist in the, in the form of like a macro database that we could easily pull from. So they were getting paper receipts, um, or what I found was actually getting a lot of text message receipts, but without doing those interviews and living in the markets, I wouldn't have realized, hey, this is a data source that we can actually use to do this. And so how did you take what you learned from your interviews and wh what did you do with that, uh, whether it's a revelation or thought? How, did it haunt you? Did it just sort of sit there in the background or did you continue to think like this is something that I want to change? So I unconsciously actually started lending to them myself. <laughs> um, so as I would go market to market, there were obviously con you know, business owners that I was like, well, no one's going to fund you, I will. Um, so I started using my savings, and finally one day a friend of mine came to visit me, and he said, you know, Shvani, I don't understand why, first of all, they, like all my friends thought I was crazy, but they, you know, a friend of mine came to in me and said, you know, when I look at this street, I see five businesses, um, in this particular story, he said, five tile makers that actually look exactly the same to me. You know, why did you decide to fund SEMA instead of, any one of the other ones. Um, and I, I rattled off a few things and I said, well, you know, when I look at her business and I knew her well, I said, you know, she buys her inventory every third Thursday of the month. She's actually saving money, you know, consistently for her son to take this particular vocational uh, training class. Um, she is, you know, when you look at how many people come into her store versus the others, she has m people spending more time in her store than other people, about two hours more. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and he's like, got it. Okay, so because you don't have traditional data on her, what you're doing is actually using her daily life to underwrite her. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. And so what I became obsessed with was then saying, well, great, now I know how to solve the problem. All I need to do is figure out how can I find a very scalable and accurate source of this daily life data? Um, and how can I find that data in such a way that it is I think painless and easy for the customer to provide to us. And that, that was it. So early on you're loaning your own money before you got investors? Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's your my, money, yeah. it's really your money. And um, tell us about the transition to the, the first iteration of the company and you, you ra I think you raised some friendly money initially of a few hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And then when did it become sort of clear the problem you were solving and how you were going to solve it uniquely, different than anyone. I mean, initially when, you, when, when, I, when I see the company, I was like, oh, you know, it's, it's sort of credit, credit identity, credit evaluation, and you start thinking of the big players, at least in the U.S., you know, credit, 
companies, Equifax, TransUnion, and you think like, that's not even close to your competition. As a matter of fact, they, they want nothing to do with your customer, they're in a totally different market. So sometimes we get scared off with big players and think, oh, well, they could do it more easily. Well, they can, but they're not. So when did it, it become crystal clear to you the problem you were solving and how you were going to uniquely solve it with, with data and, and mobile technology? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I, well, one, I started actually just, you know, continuing to, to understand the problem. So I, I did crazy things like I emailed 1,500 people on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I clearly like doing interviews, but I really wanted to understand, is anyone else solving this problem? Um, and over time, what I started to realize is, you know, people kept saying, no, 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 you should just solve the problem. Um, the other thing I realized in the research is actually, and I mean, I'm still surprised by this, that only about 30% of the adult population worldwide is even covered by a bureau. So you're totally right that like Equifax, TransUnion, no one is actually really looking at this population, but it's because of the fact that it's not just that we don't have data on them, it's actually that they are now becoming easier to reach, but until now we actually really in a sense didn't see them. And I think that's the other thing to remember is like this population is in a sense now reachable. Um, that's the, that was like the light bulb moment of, oh, wait a minute, I, I think these customers are credit worthy. Oh, I can use daily life data, but where does that daily life data sit? Um, and how can I reach them? It's all on the mobile phone. And that's the one access point that I believe actually equalizes all of us. And that's, that's why I really kind of go back to that piece of, we don't think of ourselves as a you know, data company, a financial services company, any of those tags. We actually really think of us as in a sense, sometimes like a, a social justice company um, and a company where we think like someone in the US, someone in India, Mexico can all get scored in the same way now um, because the one thing we have in common is our phones. Yeah, and as you sort of travel the developing world, you, you know, that's, that is the technology that allows them to not leapfrog, but at least catch up quickly. Because totally. even though they may not have landlines, they may not have certain things at home, everybody has a cell phone almost worldwide now. And uh, so, you know, your idea couldn't have happened 20 years ago. It's yeah, sort yeah. of a, a time now. When did you uh, start developing, you know, the, the methodologies, the algorithms to, to sort of mine the data from their cell phones? And what are you, what are you tracking? Yeah, totally. We, um, so we put out our first model uh, in Kenya in 2015. Um, so we started the company in late 2013. Um, so I learned how to code while I was working. So I, after the UN, went back into investment banking um, and then on the side was doing this. And so we started in 2013. We raised our seed round then. Um, and when we talked about this on the phone, in order to build our first model, the way to do it is actually to go get both good customers and bad customers. So we essentially had to go lend. We did blind lending. Um, and we intentionally decided we're not going to put a model out there. We're going to go get bad customers um, because if we don't understand that behavior, then we can't actually build the other side of it. Um, and then it's so I prophetic when you think about it, because the first question you ask with anyone lending money is like, what's your default rate? Right. Well, what's the what's the rate at which people default and don't pay you back? Because that sort of determines uh, how you lend, what rates you charge. And when she said, well, well we purposely needed default defaulting loans you're like when you're a startup and you don't have limited cash you know you're not trying to lose money right but you learn so much from the way people default right yeah and how to, how to customize your program totally because I mean otherwise the model doesn't learn um, and right so it's if it's only seeing good if it's only seeing good then what's it really differentiating between and it's going to have blind spots because you haven't sort of picked up. So what did you, can you share any of that or is that all like proprietary IP of, of what you track? Yeah, I mean, I, I won't go. What makes go a good borrower <laughs> in a cell phone so we can make sure we're walking the right places at the right times? Yeah, and I, I think I should be clear that we're, we're not mining people's text messages or any of those things. Um, I mean, I think it goes back into, you know, the problems, the, the different problems that we have to solve to actually solve access to credit. So as I said in the beginning, you know, across our markets or across the world, most markets don't even have a national ID system. 
Um, so in the Philippines, for instance, which we think of as a pretty developed market, um, there is 17 different forms of identity that are accepted. So that's pretty hard. Um, so you have to first think of, okay, how am I going to verify identity? Um, and so we had to actually build our own sort of identity verification system into the application. Um, so we do selfie checks um, and we ask people to upload the front and back of their IDs. And so we built an automated system for that. Then the next piece is to say, okay, now we can upload these IDs. Now we need to know what's fraud and not fraud. And so there's a whole way we do that aspect. And so with fraud, a lot of the fun part um, is actually really thinking about user behavior. And that is really interesting to think of it as like, all of us have unique, I would say, fingerprints of how we use applications. Um, I think that's like kind of the best way to put it without going into too much is the way you move through an application is going to be different than, you know, we're going to be very different from each other. And so we almost think of the data set that you create through your behavior as, as an actually part of your identity. And so if we ever find that again, that's going to tell us something different. Or if we find the same patterns in how you use data, like you create a pin. Um, if, you know, fraudsters, what we've learned is they're very lazy. <laughs> and so we ask people to create a one-time pin. Um, what we found is fraudsters will generally keep the same exact pin because they they're not going to try to remember multiple ones. Um, so that's going to set off a red flag for us. Um, or we, we've designed our application in such a way that it's almost kind of like a game. Um, so when I studied econometrics, my background's in game theory. And again, that same concept of how you go through a game tells us a lot about your financial decision making or just your, your anxiety levels, your, you know, your psychology at that moment. And so if we give you the option to review an application, do you take it? Um, if so, how long do you review the application? Um, you then go ahead and have the option to edit the application. Do you edit the application? If so, what questions do you edit? All of those different things give us an insight into you. Um, so it's actually less on mobile data and a lot more on in-app data. Um, and then the mobile data that we are collecting is location data. We want to understand, hey, you say you are a restaurant owner. Are you actually ever at the restaurant? <laughs> like, we should see that, right? Um, or we, we see that you, know, you are signing up from a location that we've never seen you at. That's going to set off a red flag. Um, so again, I always bring it back to we're looking for consistency, and then we're looking for verification of the things that we already know about you um, from the application. So it's like it's really not uh, super black boxy. It's pretty uh, simple. And our models are actually, I would say, very, um, I guess, like we think of it from a data ethics uh, policy side that if you create models that are, you know, with thousands of features and different data points, you actually don't know uh, what your model might be biasing against, sure. right? And so what we've tried to do is instead be very cognizant of what's the context behind every feature we put into the model. So for instance, we don't put in gender, we don't put in race, we don't put in religion, we don't put in the number of languages someone speaks. Um, we're not putting in these things because when we think about it, it actually could bias us from a particular segment or population, um, and we stand for access, so we don't want to do that. So, Tala, now you can, the beauty of your algorithm and your program is, uh, what are your operating hours as a lender? 24-7. Uh, and how quickly can you make loan decisions and disperse money? Um, so 85% of our customers across all our markets get capital in their account in under two minutes. So going from downloading to getting money in. Just, just think of like how much better that is than any other alternative that people in these places have. Even I, here. I was gonna, that's even what I here. always say is like I don't even have access to credit like that. <laughs> like having an ATM on your back. It's just, it really is impressive. And so... We, you talked about doing a friends and family round. I want to get the students to ask you questions. We promised we'd get her out of here. It was close to 7.30, so I want to make sure you guys can ask her questions. Um, since everyone asks us, how much have you raised to date? Mm -hmm. um, so we've raised now about $110 million. Um, so our seed round, the formal first seed round in 2013, was uh, $1.2 And now raising 
your last round was really significant. I think it was six, 65. 65, mm -hmm. so 65 million. Um, what is that money sort of the bulk of that money earmarked for growth? Yeah, so uh, in the last year, we um, expanded to four, the four new markets. So Kenya was our first country, um, and then we launched you know, India, Mexico, Philippines, Tanzania. Um, our team grew. Uh, so we went from, you know, at, I think back in 2017, I don't know, we're now 380 people. <laughs> um, and I think back then we were maybe about 125. Um, so the team has really grown. Um, and then the other fun part, I think, is really the added value. So we, we added about 1.7 million new borrowers, but about 3.5 million uh, users onto the platform in the last 12 months. Um, but then I think the other aspect has been really like adding education, adding content, um, adding in a lot more like rewards and loyalty and, and really making it something customers love. That's great. Questions from students. Do you have a microphone ready? Is the attendance sheet going around? Let's get a mic out. Thank you so much for coming. My name's Emily. I was wondering how you market to your customers and how they find out about your um, app. Sure. Um, so it actually, I mean, similar to how we find out about apps here is we'll use Facebook, we'll use Twitter, Google AdWords. Um, we do some SEO. So a lot of it is digital. And then about 60% of our customers will come in organically and through uh, referrals. Um, thank you. My name is Sarah. How do you choose your markets? It's a good question. Um, I would say the, the easiest way to think about how we do it is we, do, we think about this calculation between effort to opportunity. So we think of you know, where is the largest you know, sort of demand for credit, underserved population, because ultimately we want to continue moving towards our mission, um, which is to get to that global underserved population. Um, so we think of it as like, okay, where are the large markets that we can go into? And then what's the feasibility of getting into the market and operating? And so from the feasibility perspective, we look at political climate, we look at currency fluctuation, we look at what's the prevalence of smartphones. That's the one dependency we have right now is Android. Um, we look at what are the payment rails in the market. Uh, we're looking at you know, any sort of credit bureaus to understand like, is there an identity system? Is there any sort of credit history? What's actually happening? Um, so that's like some of the basics, but we've got a scorecard that, you know, it's about 22 indicators, and we're always looking at probably like a top five list of where to go next, um, and then watching as markets change. Um, so like sometimes we'll look at a market uh, like Nigeria, for instance, which looks like, a, again, a market that we should enter, but you know, until this past year, the currency actually wasn't even floating. Um, so it makes it a little bit difficult when we come into a market and we're bringing US dollars in um, to be able to exchange um, into the local currency. So like some things just make it impossible. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, your business is very interesting. Um, I just had a question. What's uh, what would you say Tala's greatest challenge is right now? Like, is it technological in nature? Is it interpreting and then benchmarking? You know, the data across different markets and cultures. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I always go back to. I think the the biggest challenge for Tala is actually the same thing, which is we we're not really solving just one point. We're actually having to solve the entire infrastructure. <clears throat> and so in that sense, I mean, I think a challenge is just as a startup, we're having to take on a lot of other pieces to solve the ultimate problem. Um, and in that sense, we're spread thin. Um, and so I would say that like really ultimately the biggest challenge is talent and recruiting um, because I, I'm, I'm confident that we can solve these pieces if we just had enough people. <coughs> Are you, hiring, uh, are you hiring young, smart people out of college? We are. Many, actually. Be prepared for what follows. Hi, thanks. Hello? Oh, there it is. Um, I think it's cutting out. Oh, no, it's back. Um, <laughs> can you hear me if I just start? I can, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, thank you again for coming. I was wondering if there's anything that you currently do now for your system or you plan to do in the future that prevents um, the money lent from leaking out 
of the communities and the markets that you choose to go into in the first place. Um, mm. Because I know that like, a big issue with lending in the types of markets that it seems like you go into is when that money comes in and then it immediately leaves and doesn't circulate within that specific community. So I was just curious if, if that's a piece that you're thinking about or, or trying to tackle as well. Yeah, um, let me kind of clarify the question just to make sure I answer it correctly. Um, so you're asking more, okay, we lend money to a particular customer. Um, do we know whether that customer is then sending the money to potentially a different country or to different family, maybe? Yeah, so like they're using it for their business, but if, if the businesses um, or, or the purchases that they make with that money, if it continues to circulate within that specific community that they're in as opposed to um, going to another country or even like on a smaller level to another city um, or a, a more affluent part of that area as opposed to the area that they operate in. Um, and maybe that's just something that you guys are, are not concerned about. But I was just curious if that was part of the consideration at all. Definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of our customers are, I would say, more the the very, you know, very, very small business owner, the sole proprietors. Um, and so from that aspect, the money is generally staying in the community um, or in that, I would say, area because um, it's pretty neighborhood driven in terms of how they run their businesses, where they're buying inventory from. Um, it's generally in the same radius. Um, and what's interesting is actually we can back into that because of the transaction data we have. Um, so we are generally seeing the same flows. Um, what's pretty cool is actually our network data. Um, what we found is actually in, let's say, one of our most mature markets, uh, like Kenya, uh, what we found is for every one new customer that comes in, they actually already have 10 existing relationships with uh, 10 other borrowers. And so it's pretty cool because what we are seeing is that kind of community-driven driven aspect of our business where customers are telling each other. Um, and so it's pretty concentrated in these communities. The other aspect is we're thinking of it actually as more that when we give mo uh, money to our customers, when they actually cash out, and so we give it to them digitally, when they go and actually try to you know, use it in the form of physical cash, um, they get charged for that, right? So we're not charging them for that, but the payment rail system is actually charging them for that. Um, and then when they go cash back in, they get charged again. Um, and so what we have realized is actually we can help our customers actually use the capital in a digital form. Um, and that will actually enable them to save money because they're not losing that leakage. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we're also able to understand better what the use cases are and potentially even go buy the inventory for them, you know, uh, and, and things like that. So that's kind of the future state. But I would say for now, at least we know the money does stay within the communities. Hi, um, so unrelated to Tala, what was the greatest takeaway for, or the most valuable takeaway from your first job kind of as it relates to your career or life um, in its total scope? <laughs> like, like basically like what was, what was the thing, so like as a college student looking for a first job, like what were you, was it like looking for skills for mentorship? Like what was kind of the main thing that you got out of that first job that really translated to success later on down the line? It's a good question. Um, I guess, I mean, this would be back when I was doing investment banking, equity research was my first job. Um, I don't know, I think maybe one thing that I learned from that experience was um, it, you really do have to be willing, I think, in any position. Um, and I think even getting here shows the same thing, which is you have to be willing to get into the details. And so I think a lot of times, because I think all of us are so good at actually being able to consume a lot of information very quickly, sometimes if you don't do the 3,500 interviews or you know, when I was doing equity research, if I didn't take the extra step to not just read earnings reports and look at you know, the, the actual statements, but actually went deeper into understanding the business, I wasn't actually able to give a good recommendation. Right? And so I think that's what sets people apart is like when they know their domain inside and out. And so I would say that's the best piece of advice I could give is actually knowing the problem wherever you are. Hi, uh, thank you very much for here. My question is, 
from the loans you give, what's the percentage of the customers that do not pay back, and what's the consequence of like to these people? Sure. So our I would say our um, non payback rate is uh, below seven and a half percent. Um, and then the consequence is the only sort of penalty that we have is that you can only have one loan outstanding at any time. And so if you don't repay, we, that's the one rule we have is that we will not give you another loan until that first loan is paid off. And for us, that's really just because we don't want to create over indebtedness. We don't want there to be like loan stacking. And so we're very like open with our customers about that. So we give them 365 days. So the term may be 30 days or 90 days, but we actually say at any point in that 365 days, they can come back in. Uh, we also have a flat fee structure, and so the, the fee doesn't actually accrue or compound. Um, and so it's literally like you take out $100, we charge you five bucks, um, and you pay us back uh, at that point. And so it's not gonna go from $5 to $20 to $30. It stays five dollars at thirty days, ninety days, one hundred and twenty days. That's the nicest lender you'll ever hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Uh, I just had a quick question: Why just Android? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, mainly because you know, I guess I, I don't know if you guys all know, iOS is a closed system. So now that we've actually moved to more behavioral data, we are looking at iOS. Um, but what I would say is actually price point wise, our customers can't afford and uh, can't afford iPhones. Um, they're just totally out of reach. And so when you look at the price point of Android, it's about $25. Um, at most, our customers are, take, are getting like $50 phones, um, but it's much more accessible to that, to that population. Hi there, thank you so much for sharing your story tonight and your business is amazing. Um, clearly you've been able to go out and find an incredible problem that needed to be solved and an incredible way to solve it. Do you have any tips for us on you know, how to find the big problems out there that nobody's solved yet? <laughs> Sorry, that's a great question. No, I, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, I would say sometimes problems find you, right? Um, but you've got to, I guess the thing that maybe I can say from my experience is like, I, I didn't think this was going to be the problem I was going to solve. Um, you know, I did my master's in health economics and econometrics and thought I would be solving problems around public health. Um, and really the problem I wanted to go out and solve initially was, you know, how can we actually help people, you know, prevent health issues? Um, but what I realized is we can't do that if they don't have money. Right? If they can't actually go get preventative care, then we can't solve that problem. And so it kept coming back to how do we actually help people earn a living? How do we actually solve for these like income inequality problems? Um, that got me back into, okay, well, it's even bigger than income inequality. It's actually like access to credit, access to education, all of those things. They all kept coming back to liquidity. Um, and so that's why I was like, okay, well, I guess I gotta go solve that first. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, presenting. So, you said that you give flat fee, but like every economy has like inflation, and deflation. How did you manage to standardize like like fluctuations between like inter in, uh, international business? Sure. Um, so it does have inflation, but what we what we do ourselves is we're actually like hedging, um, essentially based on the currency fluctuation. So again, we're, we're bringing US dollars in um, and then actually converting that into the local currency. Um, and so because of our, I mean, maybe this is too much information, but um, because of how our capital turns over, um, we don't actually have to worry about the inflation rate changing as much because you're essentially making up for it in the velocity of the capital. Um, so the term is only 30 days, and so when people pay back, you can immediately recycle the capital. And so one dollar is actually used about 12 and a half times per year instead of you know the traditional one time. So if, their, if their inventory is is money, <coughs> they turn their inventory 12 and a half times a year. That's unheard of. In any um, um, hi, thank you so much for coming over here. 
Um, thank you so much for coming in. My question was more of how did you balance doing so many things at the same time? Because you jump from like public health to econometrics to learning coding. And it's, um, the more you search, the more you have to take on more things to do. So I was wondering, was there ever a limit where you were like, I can do these things and focus and prioritize these things? Or did you um, divide out your time? Sure. Um Kind of. I mean, like I worked full time while I was building the company. Um, so for the first two years or so, I had a full time job. Um, so it did make it very difficult. <laughs> um, I don't know. I didn't. I, I will admit I slept about three and a half hours in that period of, you know, per day. But I was, you know, it's like sometimes sometimes you're going to realize like balance is. I mean, I think you said it in the beginning. Um, it's what you make of it, right? So I was obsessed with solving this problem and it didn't feel like work. It didn't feel like I was out of balance because I just was so excited every single day. I am definitely not suggesting that. <laughs> um, I am just saying that I think it depends on, I think it depends on who you are, the time you have, the other priorities that are in your life um, and what you can take on at that moment. I, I honestly didn't know a thing about starting a business so like i would say you guys are super super lucky um because you're taking a class on that right and you're already exposed to it i didn't know anything about venture capital i mean i knew the industry existed but i didn't know a thing about raising capital really you know getting investors forming a company um our 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 very like early lawyer laughs because we got a term sheet before we were incorporated right like I came to her and I was like, I don't know, someone wants to fund this thing. And she's like, I did not see that. We have to actually get you incorporated first. <laughs> um, so my point is like, I was really good on other things and that was about solving the problem. And then the other stuff of like it turning into a company and getting investors and all that other stuff, like it came along the way uh, once I had the results. Speaking of balance, we promised to get her out. So this will be the last question. We promise we'll be to her. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that people weren't really solving this problem before, and then you came up with this great idea. Um, now that it's out there, have you seen a lot of competitors kind of starting to do the same thing? And um, how do you keep up to date with going into other markets if maybe people are doing the same thing now? It's a good question. Um, yeah, so we started in 2013, and uh, I would say we started seeing competitors come in in about 2015-16. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, when you think of the technology we're using, um, we're using a lot of, I think we try on the front end to be very simple. And so in that sense, the barriers to entry on the UX side are not there. Um, and so you're definitely right. Like we've seen copycats. I think one of, the one of the things I think we think about when we think about competition is there's good competition where they're doing it for the same reasons and we're competing on quality, right? We're competing on price, speed, um, access, all that kind of stuff, that's really, I think, healthy. And we talk about it at Tala saying we should actually have respect for our competitors because they make us better. Um, the stuff we worry about on competition as we see more copycats come in is really around um, the ones that are doing it for unethical reasons, um, where they're using our name in bad ways or you know, they'll, they'll call themselves like Tala Mobile, Tala, these you know, different things. And so sometimes when our brand, when we're early in a market, the customer doesn't know it, they could end up getting you know, defrauded because of that. So that's more where we're worried about competition and figuring out, like, do we do a lot of press or should we not? Like, it's a, it's a you know, trade-off. Um, when we think about new markets and how we go in from a competitive side, if that's the question, um, we're still looking for white space to understand you know, when we go into a market, are we going to have a big enough opportunity? Um, because if there is already competition, then we may not need to. Again, the point is actually for us to solve the problem. And so if we feel like the problem is solved in a market, we can use our resources somewhere else. I, uh, I've heard about the company for so long, and it's really nice to hear your story in person. Just so many great takeaways, one of which I hope you take away is there may be opportunities. Can you forward to us a contact in terms of opportunities available at the, at the company? So if uh, our graduating seniors and people who just got out can, can look into it? 
Sure. Um, I was going to say it's pretty simple. Okay. Um, so our email address. Of course it is. <laughs> our email addresses are. Um, so if you're looking for internships, it's just interns at tala.co. Um, you can look at what we've got on the website, or otherwise, if you can think of a position for yourself, just email us and <coughs> tell us about yourself um, and what you'd like to do. Um, we also do that on our full-time jobs, and so that one is just careers at Tala. Um, and then if you don't see something on there, but again, you're excited and you think that there is something that we should be bringing you in to do, uh, just tell us. And then I'm happy to also provide my email address. Um, <laughs> you want 300 emails. Uh, you're welcome to. You're absolutely welcome. <laughs> um, my email is just my first name, at Tala. You guys would have figured it out anyway, so <laughs> it's not a big deal. Let's please thank Sharani Sorora.